The Maryland Department of Health and Mental Hygiene Hospital Breastfeeding Policy Maternity Staff Training Program, From Baby to Breast, Anatomy and Physiology, Session 3. Objectives. All healthcare professionals should understand the basic anatomy and physiology of the breast during lactation to be able to help a breastfeeding mother. This session will provide the learner with information on basic breast anatomy and physiology involved in lactation, the impact and the role hormones play in the process, provide a basic understanding of milk production, and understanding a baby's role in milk transfer, along with breast care instructions for breastfeeding mothers. Breasts come in all shapes and sizes, but babies can feed from almost all of them with a little support and knowledge from trained maternity staff. Breast development occurs over several stages during a woman's life. Embryogenesis begins during the early embryo development. A primitive milk streak develops from the axilla to the groin. By 12 to 16 weeks, smooth muscle cells begin to develop in the nipple and the areola, while epithelial cells start to form a mammary bud. By 32 weeks, the mammary bud has branched into a ductal system from the circulating placental sex hormones from the mother. Between 32 and 40 weeks, lobular alveolar structures contain colostrum. Pubital starts before the onset of menses between the age 10 to 12 years. Puberty hormones, estrogen, pituitary factor, and growth hormones stimulate breast tissue development in girls starting with the growth of ducts through the fat tissue in the chest walls. Later in puberty, once the menstrual cycle begins, the release of ovarian steroids and progesterone results in mammary tissue growth and during each menstrual cycle, proliferation and active growth of the ductal tissues occur. When ovulation begins to occur, progesterone is excreted during the luteal phase. This starts the development of the alveolar structures in the glandular tissue of the breast. External visible development or enlargement can be seen by the internal development in the gland. However, the breast is not considered fully developed until after milk production has occurred. Before the onset of menstruation, branching of the ductal tree occurs. Lactogenesis occurs during pregnancy with ductal and lobular development accelerated with the influence from hormones excreted during pregnancy. The final stages of breast development and milk production occur during lactation. We'll talk more about this during this presentation. Involution occurs when lactation is discontinued and prolactin levels drop. Lactogenesis 1 begins around mid-pregnancy 16 to 18 weeks gestation. Ductal and lobular development accelerates with the influences from hormones excreted during pregnancy. The glandular structure is able to begin secretion of colostrum by the last trimester. Some women may experience leaking, others will not. Both situations are normal. Let expectant moms know there is no need to express this milk before the baby is born. Lactogenesis 2. These changes occur after the delivery of the placenta, resulting from the sharp decrease in progesterone and estrogen levels and prolactin levels remaining high. The onset of copious milk secretion occurs between 30 and 96 hours after delivery of the placenta. This is typically known as the milk coming in. Most women feel increasing breast fullness around the second to third day after the birth. Milk production changes in this phase from endocrine to autocrine control. In lactogenesis 2, milk production is controlled primarily by the rise and fall of hormones, endocrine control. Prolactin levels, which are critical for milk production, rise and fall in relation to the frequency, intensity, and duration of nipple stimulation. Lactogenesis 3, occurring between day 9 until involution, this is the milk production and maintenance phase under the autocrine control, which depends upon milk removal and direct nipple stimulation for prolactin release to occur. A feedback inhibitor of lactation, Phil, senses fullness of the breast and adjusts synthesis accordingly. If the breast is full, milk production slows. Empty breasts fill faster. Involution occurs when the milk producing system is no longer being used. Timing of involution can vary. However, most women will experience it by about 40 days after the last feeding. Early in pregnancy, the mother notes changes in her breast, including fullness, tenderness, and increased vascularness. As the pregnancy progresses, the areola enlarges and darkens in color. 
Montgomery tubercles, a sebaceous gland, are small nodules within the areola that become more prominent and secrete a lubricating substance that protects and conditions the nipple and areola. The Montgomery tubercles may also provide a scent that guides the baby to the breast. The nipple is located in the center of the areola and contains about four to nine milk duct openings. The nipple and the areola are made up of erectile smooth muscles. A bundle of these muscles beneath the nipple contracts, causing the nipple to become firm and erect with stimulation. The areola, the pigmented area surrounding the nipple, becomes darker with pregnancy. It may be small or large, and does not impact milk production. The mammary gland is the structure involved in milk production. The structures that look like bunches of grapes are alveolus, the milk producing glands. The milk is synthesized in the alveolus, then travels through the lactiferous ducts, which look like branches, and down to the nipple openings. Alveoli are the basic cells of the alveolus, 10 to 100 alveoli, which make up a mammary lobe. Surrounding each alveolus is a network of capillaries bringing nutrients for milk synthesis to the cells and a layer of myoepithelial cells around each alveolus. The top right corner of this slide shows the structure of the alveolus where milk is produced. Myoepithelial cells are wrapped around the structure of the alveolus and contract to express milk from the alveolus into the milk ducts, the center of the structure. Glandular tissue can extend beyond the breast up towards the armpit called the tail spence. While lactating women may experience fullness, tenderness in this area, this is not of concern and rather a reflection of glandular tissue in that area. While many hormones are involved in pregnancy, estrogen, progesterone, and prolactin are the three major hormones of this reproductive phase. The elevated levels of estrogen and progesterone during pregnancy prevent prolactin from stimulating milk secretion. At the time of the birth, once the placenta is delivered, estrogen and progesterone levels fall dramatically, while the prolactin levels remain elevated. This signals the breast to begin milk production. Immediately postpartum, colostrum, the first milk, is available in the breast. Keep in mind, retained placenta parts may inhibit lactation by keeping pregnancy hormones elevated. The infant sucks at the breast, stimulating the nerve endings on the nipple, causing the hypothalamus to send a message to the posterior pituitary gland to release oxytocin. The oxytocin stimulates the myoepithelial cells to contract, which in turn causes letdown. Remember from previous slides, the myoepithelial cells squeeze the alveolus, forcing the milk into the ducts. Mothers may verbalize an increase in pressure, tingling, or shooting pain as a result. This contraction is not limited to the breast, thus some women feel uterine cramping during letdown as oxytocin is released into the bloodstream. With each pregnancy, the uterine contractions can be more intense. Uterine contractions decrease in intensity within the first weeks as the uterus returns to its pre-pregnancy size. Oxytocin has a calming effect on the mother. Some mothers appear to drift off or doze when oxytocin is released and milk ejection occurs. Infants placed skin to skin early and often will help mothers stimulate oxytocin release. Tense worried mothers, on the other hand, are more likely to inhibit oxytocin release, resulting in difficulties with letdown. Prolactin is released simultaneously to oxytocin from the anterior pituitary gland. This hormone causes the alveolar cells to produce breast milk, referred to as milk-making hormone. Infants suckling at the breast more than eight times in 24 hours prevent prolactin levels from dropping too low. Prolactin, unlike oxytocin, is only released by the stimulation of touch to the nipple in the areolar complex containing the nerve endings, which as oxytocin can also be stimulated by sight, smell, and sound. Milk production is controlled by supply and demand. The more the infant feeds, the more the demand, the greater the supply. It is important to note that although women have two breasts, they function independently. Each serves the same purpose, yet one may be more efficient than the other. Mothers may comment that they get more milk from one breast. This is not unusual since each breast is independent of the other. Small breasts can make the same amount of milk as large breasts over the course of a day. The size has nothing to do with glandular tissue. It actually is dependent on the amount of fat contained in the breast area. On rare occasions, breast abnormalities may make the production of adequate amounts of milk impossible. Marked asymmetry of the breast is usually an indication that one or both breasts will be affected. 
of concerned are asymmetrical or underdeveloped breasts that are tubular in shape, along with no breast changes during pregnancy. Causes can be both congenital or as a result of trauma or radiation. Another issue that can affect milk production can be patency of the ductal system. With any type of breast surgery, scar tissue or trauma to the ducts can make it impossible for an adequate amount of milk to be removed from the breast due to damage. If during surgery or trauma, nerve damage to the nipple occurs, stimulation of hormone release can be affected. If damage to glandular tissue itself occurs, the milk-making cells may be affected in the milk-making process. Infrequently, but of great concern, is when an infant refuses one breast or suddenly rejects the breast. This can be an early sign of breast cancer, referred to as Goldsmith's sign. The baby's main role is effective suckling at the breast, which will ultimately stimulate milk production, as already discussed, and removal of milk from the breast. In doing so, hormones necessary for the process of milk production and milk removal, let down, will be high. In order to have effective milk transfer, the baby must also be stimulating the breast frequently enough and for a long enough time during each feeding to both create the demand or message regarding the amount of milk needed and effectively emptying the breast. Baby-led feedings are the best way for assuring adequate demand. In doing so, the baby controls how much and how often the feedings need to occur based on hunger cues. Timed feedings, on the other hand, often either underfeed or overfeed the baby. Using pacifiers will decrease baby's urge to feed, leading to missed feedings and understimulation. When babies latch effectively, they stimulate milk production and removal. During effective suckling, the nipple is stretched into the back of the baby's throat with the lips flanged over the areola to stimulate nerve fibers. A shallow latch will not stretch the nipple effectively or provide enough stimulation to the areola for milk production or adequate milk removal. The breast will also not fully empty, which will lead to decreased milk production. A shallow latch will also cause sore nipples, resulting in discomfort, pain, and a sense of fear at subsequent feedings, ultimately reducing the amount of milk produced and possibly delayed or missed feedings. Anomalies of the face, mouth, or pharynx, such as cleft lip or palate, high palate, macroglossia, large tongue, micronanthia, recessed jaw, or tongue tie, angloglossia, can make breastfeeding difficult for infants. All of these issues can affect an infant's ability to adequately form a seal to be able to pull the nipple to the back of the throat, leading to inadequate stimulation to the breast and decreased milk transfer. Muscle or nervous system dysfunction, such as with Down syndrome, cerebral palsy, muscular dystrophy, intracranial hemorrhage, prematurity, asphyxia, or an infection affecting the central nervous system can affect breast stimulation or milk transfer. Maternal medications or anesthesia during labor or pregnancy can lead to the infant or the mother to be too sleepy and miss feedings. Birth and hospital practices such as vacuum extraction or separation of baby and mother can lead to feeding issues. Bottles and pacifiers can lead to misfeedings, disruption of effective suckling and breastfeeding, decreased milk supply, and undue engorgement. Effective suckling and breast stimulation can also be reduced by sleepy infants, missed feedings, labor drugs, or prolonged separation from mothers. Pain and trauma related to improper latch can cause early weaning due to discomfort. Babies and mothers need to exclusively breastfeed to get plenty of practice learning the process. This also allows for adequate stimulation of the breast resulting in maternal hormone production that is required for milk production. Allowing infants to feed on demand only on breast milk allows mothers to establish the best possible milk supply. Mother and baby should be kept together so that the mother can learn to respond to her baby's cues. In order for a mother to establish a good milk supply, the baby needs to feed at least 8 to 12 times in 24 hours. Focus on the number of feedings, not the spacing. By doing so, the baby is adequately fed and the mother's breasts are effectively stimulated. Each baby should determine frequency and duration of length of feedings as long as they are feeding at least 8 to 12 times in 24 hours. Newborns can feed on one breast only per session, both breasts per session, or both breasts then going back to the first towards the end of each feeding session. All these variations are common and normal and help to establish a good milk supply. 
When mothers and babies room in together, mothers more readily learn to respond to their baby's feeding cues. They should be taught to look for the infant sucking on its hands, rooting, licking, and starting to stir or wake up. When separated, mothers cannot respond to these early feeding cues and in turn, feedings often occur at a time when babies are more agitated, making feedings or latching more difficult. When separated, the feedings can be easily missed, resulting in less stimulation to the mother's breast, causing a decrease in milk production. This also places the mother at risk for engorgement from inadequate milk removal. 24-hour rooming in has been shown to increase exclusive breastfeeding rates, increase the quality of maternal sleep, and decrease the amount of infant crying. A study from the Journal of Clinical Lactation found that exclusively breastfeeding mothers not only slept more hours during the night than other mothers, but also had more energy, better mood, and a greater sense of well-being. Being tired after recently giving birth is not an unusual circumstance. Hospitals should encourage and recommend that all babies room in regardless of a mother's feeding choice so she can learn how to care for her newborn both during the day and at night before going home from the hospital. A good latch is key for effective breast stimulation and maintenance of a good milk supply. When the infant is latched well, the chin touches the breast with the nose slightly or near slightly touching the breast. You should not see the chin or the nose away from the breast. The mouth is open wide like a yawn with the upper and lower lips flanged. Lips should not be tucked in or a smacking sound heard. If the areola is large, more should be seen at the top of the breast with the lower lip covering the bottom edges of the areola. The cheeks should be full and round. The mother should feel a deep tugging sensation at the breast, not a pinching at the nipple. Swallowing should be heard with none or minimal nipple discomfort. If there is breast discomfort with the initial latch, it should be feeling better as the feeding progresses with no pain felt after two weeks. Baby should be nursing calmly with long, deep draws at the breast. Fast and frequent suckling with pulling on and off the breast are signs of a shallow latch. Repositioning may be needed to achieve a more effective latch. Emptying the breast 8 to 12 times a day is what regulates milk production. The emptying of the breast determines the rate of milk synthesis. The more the baby breastfeeds effectively and empties the breast, the more milk that is made. A breast that is too full and not emptied 8 to 12 times in 24 hours receives the signal to downregulate or shut off milk production. When the breast is too full for a prolonged period, the increased internal pressures in the breast decrease blood flow, causing the body to release a protein called feedback inhibitor of lactation or fill. This protein sends out the message to shut down cell production, causing death to the cells in the mammary gland that make breast milk. Formula feeding or pacifier use in the early days interferes with establishing a good milk supply. Feedings replaced by bottles or formula decrease stimulation to the breast, turning on the release of fill, which kills the milk-making cells, thus decreasing prolactin levels. As the breast overfills with milk, the fat content decreases. When the baby goes to the breast the next time on the overfilled breast, the baby has more difficulty latching and is hungry sooner after the feeding ends because of the lower fat content in the milk. This often starts the cycle of the mother doubting her ability to make good breast milk that satisfies her baby and reinforces the notion that babies sleep better on formula. AAP recommendations. Delay pacifier use for one month to ensure that breastfeeding is firmly established. Too often, pacifiers are used when a baby is giving feeding cues to its parents. Parents misinterpret the cues and give the pacifier instead of placing the baby on the breast to feed. Most newborns then fall asleep, sucking on the pacifier, missing a feeding, and starting the cycle of breast overfilling. The most common reason for supplementation is perceived delay in milk production by the mother. Physically, emotionally, and hormonally, babies and mothers are connected. Babies engaged with the mother, looking at her face, playing with her shirt. Mother is engaged with baby, looking, talking, interacting. This is the normal behavior of all mammals. Breast changes occur throughout pregnancy and lactation. To make milk, milk needs to be removed. Continue breastfeeding at least eight to 12 times every 24 hours. Follow the baby's signs he is ready to eat. Position and latch infant to assure milk transfer. Rooming in 24 hours, avoid formula supplements, and avoid pacifier use. Immediately after the birth, the body releases hormones to start milk production. Every time the baby nurses, the prolactin levels rise. This stimulates cells to make milk. 
It is very important to encourage the mother to nurse on demand at least 8 to 12 times every 24 hours so the body will benefit from these hormone changes and build a good milk supply. One of the most important parts of breastfeeding preparation is proper education prior to birth. Years ago, mothers were told to toughen up their nipples by rubbing them with towels. This is not necessary. There is no special preparation or care of the breast needed either before birth or prior to breastfeeding. A breast assessment should be done paying attention to scars and flat or inverted nipples. Breasts should be assessed at the beginning of the pregnancy and between 25 and 30 weeks gestation. This assessment should include prenatal breastfeeding education and encouragement to attend a breastfeeding class or support groups. Physicians, nurses, and midwives have a lot of influence with their patients. Healthcare professionals recommending a mother breastfeeds carries more weight than family and friends.